So I come from CERN. Um, this is a big particle physics accelerator uh, in Geneva, not too far from here. But I'm not here to tell you about particle physics or CERN. You may be relieved, or maybe not. <laughs> However, I do think perhaps a brief introduction may be in order. We CERNies walk around with great confidence, thinking that everybody knows what we're doing and how important it is. Um, and in fact, that's not always the case. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a pub just over the French border um, here on that ring, about a mile from CERN's main entrance. And I was chatting to a, a sweet couple who asked me where I worked. I told them I worked at CERN, and they said, ah, yes, the place that makes bicycles. <laughs> so this brought me down to earth a bit. Um, and I just nodded and said, oh, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe they were making fun of me. I don't know. I, I thought maybe later that they were, but I don't know. So, um, in fact, people don't necessarily know that CERN is the place where we built the Large Hadron Collider and where we invented the World Wide Web and where we recently found the Higgs boson. So now you know. <laughs> My experiment is the Atlas detector. Here it is. Um, someone's very helpfully drawn a picture of a Tyrannosaurus Rex to show you, uh, presumably to show you the scale of the thing. Uh, it is very, very big. It's also very smart. It's made up of millions of different components. And it took 20 years to design and test and build these. The center of the detector is the most sensitive, the piece marked in red there. Um, and further out, you have layers of materials and electronics that are the energy detectors. So all this together allows us to take a huge three-dimensional photograph of an event, which is the result of a collision of two proton beams. We collide the proton beams right in the center of the detector, and we, they smash to pieces, the protons. And the de debris flies out, sprays out into the detector, and we capture, with our different layering, we capture the tracks and the energy deposits of the particles. So this took 20 years. Um, it cost 12 billion pounds, um, some of it paid for by you, um, some element of your tax. So really, sincerely, thank you very much for that. <laughs> you could have spent it on beer, right? <laughs> So we're really grateful. Um, some of us paid tax too. Um, but what we gave you in return is this, the Higgs boson. So this is the love child of Peter Higgs and Sachendra Bose. Not everyone knows the boson bit comes from this guy. Um, it's not capitalized because he has lots of bosons named after him, um, whereas Higgs is just one. So this is, in fact, a toy model of a Higgs boson. And um, I think they've captured the likeness quite well, actually. <laughs> I like this little guy. I think I'm going to get one of these toys for myself. It reminds me very much of the smiley faces that my teacher would occasionally draw on my work if she liked what I've done at school. And in fact, sometimes if she was really pleased with my work, she would give the smiley face little earrings um, so maybe I'll make some of these for my Higgs boson. But I digress. So, the Higgs. <laughs> this graph contains two years' worth of data that we collected with the Atlas detector. So we take the data, the events, and we put them into this graph one by one. If the if, so we take a number corresponding to each event, which in this case is the mass, or the Higgs mass, or not the Higgs mass if it's not the Higgs, and we put them in to these bins in the graph. So you can see that at the, at the low end of the masses, there's quite a lot of events, and it's kind of smoothly falling towards more rare, higher mass. But then, whoops, you've got a bit of a bump there. And that's an excess of events which we claimed Higgs discovery with. 
Here's another kind of graph. This shows the number of meetings we've had per month at the LHC since 2008. I'm showing you this for more than one reason. Um, so the first reason is that it's kind of interesting because it uses time as well. The previous graph, I just showed you a single image. All the time was in there, and it, it didn't matter when those events were collected. But here, you can, you can kind of see that in May 2012, we had about 4,000 meetings that month, whereas in May 2008, we had a meager 500. The second reason that I'm showing you this graph is to give you an idea of the state of mind I was in when I decided to try and make sounds out of LHC data. So I'd had enough of meetings. <laughs> I was pretty bored and not sure if I was doing the right thing with my life. I was writing up my PhD thesis at the time, and for refuge, I used to go to a little art studio. Here it is, under some railway arches in Brixton in South London, where I lived. And some friends of mine who are musicians used to hang out there. Um, one guy in particular, a DJ and inventor called Ed Chocolate, was um, making experimental new sounds using his handmade synthesizers. And at this time, I became a bit interested. I wondered what an electron would sound like, or a muon. And actually, I thought I knew when I thought about it. But I wondered if other physicists would agree with me. And some of them did. And others said, what the hell are you talking about? But spurred on by the ridicule of my peers, I decided to at least try and make something a bit tangible out of these ideas and was lucky enough to get a small grant. So, how to go about this? The first, one of the first experimental sounds that we decided to make was by turning the 3D cylindrical atlas detector on its end, so it's like you're looking at it end on, you've got this circular vision of it. A bit like a ship's radar or a radar on a submarine, you can then create this imaginary arm that sweeps around the detector, or like the hand on a clock, picking up the energy deposits. So there's energy throughout it, so it's going to get a lot more energy than this radar is showing. So that was really the first sound example that we made. You might have noticed that there wasn't just one pitch of note in that example. There were, in fact, a kind of varying pitches. And that's because we don't just detect the position of these energy deposits with Atlas. We also look at how much energy has been deposited. So we decided in this example to assign a different pitch according to the energy of the little blob of energy we find. And if it's high energy, high pitch. I wonder if any any sailors or submarine people in World War II ever thought of doing this with their radar? Um, perhaps changing the sound that they heard based on, whether, on the size of the incoming object, whether it may have been uh, signaling impending doom, or something a little less scary. Enough of that. So anyway, all those examples that I just talked about, creating a different sound according to the physical properties, this is, like, this is called parameter mapping. Parameter mapping encapsulates all the art and science in sonification. The science is in these arrows. We don't just create a vague relationship between the sonic properties and the physical properties. The relationship has to be exact and rigorous. So we map the scale of energy, for example, to the scale of pitch, and they have to move together. The art is in where we place these arrows and which parameters we decide to use. So let's go back to our Higgs boson. Unfortunately, the Higgs boson doesn't want to exist. It will disappear if it can. It will do anything it can to disappear and turn back into pure energy, like it, like it was before it was created. In fact, this is true of all particles. 
But the ones that are inside you and me, the matter particles, can't do this. They can't decay. They're trapped in existence. The Higgs can. It can do it by many, many different ways. And one of these is to a pair of photons, which are particles of light. And this is the example that we've been playing with, with the real data that was used to find the Higgs boson. So what we measure are the photons, because the Higgs is not there to measure. But we're trying to infer something as to this puff of smoke. Was it the Higgs that created these? So how do we go about doing this? Well, there are countless ways, really. The sample that we showed with the ship's radar, we used two things, and we mapped two to two. But we wanted to try something a little bit more ambitious with the real data. So we went for a four to six mapping. It looks a bit messy and complicated. Um, but we can do that. We can do any kind of mapping we want. In this example, we've, got, we've now got time. So the graph, which I showed you before, of the Higgs discovery, we've taken the interesting region where there was this little bump, where we expected something to fall, but we found a little bump. And we took all the events in that region, and we lay them out one by one. Because we now have time, we can do that. And we mapped the duration of each node to the inverse of the momentum of the photons, such that higher momentum photons will have a shorter note. So this is a sort of first sonification. Have a listen. It goes on like that for quite a long time. <laughs> uh, sometimes get in a bit of trouble in the office. Um, <laughs> now I'm going to pay you exactly the same sonification, but this time the only change, I've tried to highlight this change, so all the mapping is the same. The arrows are in the same places, but I've scaled the duration of every note by the same amount. So everything's been scaled down, all the notes are shorter, and you'll th probably think it sounds completely different. I hope no one needs the toilet. I know it's just before coffee break. <laughs> but that was, the point is, is that was exactly the same sonification. We haven't changed anything. We've still got the same information there. But it sounds totally different. So it is completely arbitrary, the sounds you get out, really. In physics analyses, we have vast backgrounds and small numbers of signal events. And so we're constantly, the game of particle physics at the moment, really, or recently, is constantly trying to lower the amount of background and increase the amount of signal relative to it. So we say we want to increase the signal to background ratio. And we do this by various ways. And one of them is by dividing events into higher and lower energy. Um, the reason we do this is because we think that higher energy photons probably are more likely to come from a Higgs decay than lower energy photons. So, in this example, you can already see the graphical representations of the sounds. And you may notice that they look different. One of them looks more sparse. That's the higher energy one. And in fact, signal is always going to be more sparse. If we filled a swimming pool with grains of sand, and each grain of sand corresponded to an event we've collected with Atlas, and we then stuck our finger in that swimming pool, those would be the Higgs bosons that we had a chance of collecting. So it's, it's vast, the amount of background to signal. I'm going to just play you one after another now, these sounds for lower energy first and then higher energy. It's, again, you recognize this sound. So there's not many of those guys in there. What we're going to do now is throw all our events back together. The ones we think look like Higgs, and the ones we think look like rubbish, junk, the stuff that we find all the time. But we want to give a bit of weight to the ones that we fancy as Higgs. So we're going to extend the duration of the note corresponding to those events 
but play them all together. And you can see this in the graph. You can see there are spikes which fall off slowly. These are our higs, or the ones we think are. And this jaggedy background that goes all the way along, this is our background. So now we've quite clearly divided those two things. We don't know if you've done it right, but it was, it was fun trying. <laughs> so this morning, I've, uh, I've shared a few sonifications with you. And sometimes when I play people these sounds or when I talk to people about the ideas behind doing this kind of thing, they say, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> well, the point, OK. So I've had a long time to think about what the point is. I've changed my mind a few times. But um, <laughs> physicists aren't necessarily very good at thinking about things differently. Um, we're very good at some things, making graphs, uh, interpreting graphs quickly. Um, we're specialised. And the problem with specialism is it, it encourages narrow-mindedness. I'm not sure that's always a very good thing um, for us. Others quite easily see the beauty in the theory and the playfulness in the experiment. For example, my friend, who is an artist, Toya, who drew this picture, she can quite easily see the fun in this, but she probably doesn't have the tools to analyse it scientifically. Others still can't see, they're blind. But their minds are hungry for listening graphs like this. So we're in a time when data is being collected in unfathomable quantities. Most of it remains completely unusable to almost all of us. Um, this was a step to try and change that, um, a very simple and perhaps playful one. But I hope to see others doing similar things.